the podcast podcast. A podcast about podcasting from True Story FM. Hi, Pete. Hi, Andy. How you doing? Good. Enjoying the world of podcasting. What's new in this big world? Beautiful day to talk about podcasting. Look, here's the thing. I have gotten some uh, questions. I've got some uh, a, a friend who is uh, uh, embarking on a podcast journey himself and has been asking questions about, you know, how does it work? And I realize there's a there's a thing we haven't talked about, which is the thing that I think a lot of podcasters don't think about until it's it's late in the game. And that is how do you organize the back end of your show, right? Because getting the show in a podcast feed and sending it out is is you know, fairly straightforward. But once you start doing multiple episodes of a given show, how do you prep? How do you plan for it? What technology are you using to keep your episodes organized so that you know what you've talked about in the past and what you're ready to talk about in the future? And so I thought, hey, we do that, you and me. We have <laughs> we been sure do. doing that a lot for a lot of shows for a lot of years. And so I thought, hey, let's talk about it. We're making a podcast. Uh, I mean, how in depth are we looking? Like, we're assuming that the recording, the editing, that's kind of taken care of. Are we coming into this conversation at the point where I have my little freshly edited and recorded or recorded and edited show and now I need to figure out what to do with it? No, I think let's start even further back. Let's start Ooh, okay. at, at the, uh, the, the sort of idea stage of an episode. Right. I'm going to assume that we have a show that we've done a few episodes of our show and now we're planning for the next episode. What are the tools that we use and what's the thinking that goes into how we organize the administrative side of the podcast? Excellent. OK, so all the way back to the germ of the idea, where do I put this germ of an idea? That's true. And I when we started and I think a lot of podcasters start this way. They start in, especially if you're working with somebody else, they start in Google Docs, right? Google Docs is the easiest of the easy way to create a collaborative note across platforms, across computers, across dis great distances. Many people can go in and add ideas to build a show outline and, and start talking. And I have heard recently of people who have had a single Google Doc that they use for their podcast, and they just keep adding stuff to it to talk about. And every episode is just scrolling down to see where they left off and start talking about the next thing on the list if it's still appropriate. And that Google Doc then is uh, tens of pages, hundreds of pages long. Uh, it's massive and kind of unwieldy. And uh, to, to my brain, it breaks. Can you imagine? That's, it's a hard way to process that. I just, I don't know. I don't know how well I could do it. It's a little free form for me. I like, <laughs> I like having it split up a little bit. So it's easier to figure out where am I starting and ending? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's really, it's delightful to hear you say it's quote, a little free form for me. That might be the biggest <laughs> understatement of the show and maybe our relationship. <laughs> I'm not calling you rigid. No, but organized. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, for a while, we augmented this approach and we used a Google Sheet. So we created a spreadsheet for every episode uh, of the show. And that allows us to start capturing some tabular data. And so we can have, you know, when are we recording? What is the date of recording? What is the date of release? If it's a member podcast, what is the date of the, the member version release versus the public version? Once you have tabular data, you can start sorting and, and searching and seeing stuff. And then all we would do is click and create a link on the title of the, of the episode in the spreadsheet and link that to a Google Doc. So when you click on it, it opens a Google Doc, and that is the show note. That's the actual outline that we would use to record the show. And we used that for a lot of years, I think. A lot of yeah, years. Yeah, quite a while. Uh, but then, you know, the, the world opened up for us, and we heard an <laughs> angel choir I, is that how it hit you? I think it might have hit you that way um, when we started using Coda.io. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's such a, a nice tool to use because it really feels like a smart way to blend what you get out of a Google Doc, but also you're, you're, you have the opportunity of spreadsheets built into them. You have a database, like it's, it's like all of those Microsoft Office tools squeezed into one place. 
and um, it's just it works uh, very fluidly. And I I don't know if uh, all of the people tuning in have heard of Coda, but it's absolutely worth looking at because it just it's such a handy way to kind of streamline the process of building all of these things in a an easy to manage way. Oh my God, it's in, it's really wonderful. And uh, so what we do when we set up a new show is we create a new CODA document. Now, CODA document is kind of misleading because a document is made up of many different sections and you could put folders and sidebars and all kinds of things. The root of a CODA document for us is the show episode database. And so we create a, tabul- a tabular section in CODA that says, here are all of our episodes. And then we can expand each one of those lines into to see the show episode record. What goes in the episode record? Can you what what do you see when you open the episode record? Well, you, I, I just want to say for everybody that I still have a struggle using the right names for everything in Coda. <laughs> like, I just call everything in there a document. So when you're saying your record, I'm like, you know, I don't know actually what he's talking about. Like, it all... It it they've changed the names of things, and so that's something I don't like about Coda. I don't know if we want to share this with all of our guests, but I do. I I do feel like some of the naming in there is a little frustrating. So so the record, I guess, is is when you step into a. Well, that might be me. Is, that might be me using because it's kind of old school database <laughs> jargon, right? Like in a database, it's made up of tables and records, and. Um, And that's so I'm sorry for that. That's not that's unfair to you (laughs) to introduce that. The way way Toda, the way Coda says it is it's a row, right? And you expand the row. So we create a row. And when you click on the the fancy expando arrows, it brings up. I I don't even know what to call it now. I guess it's still a row, but a record it's, a pa- it's like a page like okay like I, I call it a document like i'm not because it it kind of feels like a <laughs> nested document this is like their words don't make sense but when you are experiencing it it makes perfect sense okay. but it is it's okay. like the it's like the the house we'll call it of all the information for what's in that row you've got your show notes you've got all of your links you've got the your script from the show. You've got all of the things that you're going to be sharing with everybody, like your uh, your iframe or your direct download MP3. All of that stuff ends, ends up in there. In addition to, like, you have, um, you can put all of the different um, uh, tags for your hosts and any guests that you have that build into those tables as well. So it's all connected on the back end. Yeah, and that, I mean, we can't underscore. When you're looking at, the house and then each of the rooms of the house <laughs> are the other tables that talk to it. I, uh, Coda, uh, stick- with the people at Coda, please get in touch with us. We'll help you rename all of these elements. Uh, it's all going to be house. Elements. House related. We'll like- right. Right. It's all real estate now from now on. So the neighborhood is the dock and never mind. So the, the connected tables, like it's it, being able to connect tables to one another is really, really useful. So we always start with a show table, um, but we do have a hosts and guests table that are separate tables and they're interconnected. So the guest table is really powerful. And it's a thing that we use all the time for a lot of our shows. Um, It has the guest headshot. It has the guest name. It has the pronunciation. It has their pronouns. It has their bio. It has links to other, you know, books they've written or movies they've worked on or, you know, anything that that is related to them. And that allows us to maintain that over time. If they're repeat guests, we don't have to keep going back to them to, you know, to and badger them for updated information. And we end up getting a resource library of what ends up being hundreds of guests who've been on our podcasts over the years. And so when we come up with a topic in the future, it's a quick search to figure out who would be best to talk about this thing on an upcoming topic on an upcoming show. Maybe we just check our own guest library to see who is a topical expertise. We can also, because it's cross-referenced, we can go into a guest, into a guest's record room, a guest room, (laughs) we go into the guest room in Coda, and it'll show us all of the episodes that that guest has been on over the years. And so, you know, for example, the Taking Control of the ADHD podcast, we have what are uh, what we refer to as our Hall of Fame guests who've been on the show five, 10 times over the last, you know, 
14 years. And um, it's really nice to be able to celebrate th- how their work has changed by continuing to invite them to the show and update that guest record and, and see their work. So the, all of that stuff is is where the that's kind of the locus of our our podcast. Every show that we do has a coda doc that is the canonical truth of each show. Yeah. And, you know, just to clarify, when we're saying like things about the tables and the guests and all of this information, like that's all malleable. It's stuff that we have determined we want to be collecting, that we want to be putting in here. And that's what's so great about Coda is like it all is malleable to whatever works for you. What are you needing to collect from the guests? What are you wanting to make sure are part of your show? It's it's not like some hard and rigid form that we have. It's actually all just, you know, we can choose what we want to be uh, seeing and collecting. What do you, is there anything on your list? And I'm, this is a leading question because I have one unanswered. Is there anything on your list that you wish Coda would do for you that it doesn't? Um, make me breakfast sometimes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I, I don't. Call the what, devs. What, what are you? Yeah. <laughs> I, the thing that I actually know Coda can do, but I haven't figured out how to do it because of time and other roadblocks, is to actually publish to our website. That is a thing mm. that if Coda is really the canonical truth, I feel like the next step for me is to figure out how to have a publish button on here that says connect these fields to WordPress and send them to our WordPress site when we publish an episode, because that would remove the last step for us to be able to to publish the, the show on the website. It, it also it doesn't publish to Transistor, which is our host on the back end, Transistor FM, uh, fantastic uh, host. Um, but uh, just s- removing the the WordPress integration would be, or uh, step would be a, a great step in the right direction. So uh, that would be nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But other than that, it, it like Andy said, I mean, it's it, because it's a hundred percent customizable. I mean, we can do whatever we want, and it makes it, it. And I think it's pretty user friendly too, right? I mean, it's not. Oh. You don't have to be a developer to use Coda. You don't have to be a developer to use Coda. It does take some learning just to figure out, like, I feel like the the element of learning how to, like, step into these uh, different, um, step through the door into the house house. for each of these is is something that is a little tricky for people to um, get used to the first time. But I feel like once you've gotten used to that, it's, it's pretty understandable and easy. Uh, Andy said um, a minute ago, he said, yeah, you can see the script for the shows. And, and that's a that's a thing I want to make sure we we call out because, you know, we keep all of our sh- episode notes for our recording process in Coda, too. So we have a little template that we spin up. that's temporary. And we have all of our, you know, here's the show intro, our scripted stuff, the topics, the bulleted list of the topics we want to talk about. We always copy and paste that and add it to the show record for that episode. Again, because it's so wickedly searchable, we can search the show for specific topics and see what we've talked about in the past. It makes it incredibly easy to have this one place that has not just the finished product of a show uh, as a record, but all of the notes that went into it. Same thing with transcripts. When we're creating transcripts for our episodes, for our client shows in particular, we always paste the transcript link in there too so that we can go and and search that transcript for specific topics. It's useful to have everything in one place. And so that's what, I I think that's the the big brain of our our backend podcasting operation is CODA. What other tools yeah. would do you count on for getting the job done? I mean, in the in the early stages, uh, you know, we're we're talking about kind of like putting it together. I, I feel like the next big tool is recording the show, um, unless you think I'm missing a step. But recording the show, you know, we'll we'll record in Discord sometimes, uh, but we've also been using Streamyard quite a bit, which is we feel like a nice step up over what Zoom had been providing because what StreamYard offers with uh, everybody who you have on the line is uh, it's recording audio on their system. And so Zoom will record individual tracks for each person, but it's recording on your 
end. So if there's any, any internet interference as uh, with one of your guests or, or hosts that you're talking with, that will all get recorded into their feed. When you record in StreamYard, it's recording on their end, and, and so you're you're getting much better audio in the end. So and that's, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. And, and I think there are a lot of tools out there, like Riverside and... Um, uh, I mean, I feel like Riverside and StreamYard are the two big ones. All right, what else is there? We also used, let's see, Squadcast, Zencaster. Like, you'll see these Zencaster, names yeah. show, show up that, uh, that allow you to go into these virtual studios. And we've used them all. And I think the, the, um, the upshot for us was that, that uh, StreamYard, the cost for performance balance was was the best for us. You know, it's a, they they do offer a free tier if you're just recording one podcast and it's a couple of times a month. It works great um, for us because we're recording so many shows, uh, so many times a week. We're on a higher end program, and the the benefit for us uh, of at, at the price is has been really the sweet spot. The other the bigger service I think in the market is Riverside, and and it's great. And we had a whole tour of Riverside. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any problems with Riverside. But to do the same thing we wanted to do, it would have been wildly more expensive. So yeah, yeah. Um, but Riverside is great. It is a yeah. great platform. A lot of the uh, a lot of places like uh, you know that are also hosting now are providing ways to record them too. Correct? Yeah, like, like Spotify Buzz, for Buzz podcasters. Sprout. Spotify, uh, I think Libsyn has a way to record now too, don't they? Mm, I think so, but now it's been a while. Um, yeah. So you can do that. I think the the warning, I guess the warning I would have is beware services that offer you 100% integration, recording and distribution, because sometimes the, the, the um, trade-off is lock-in. Like, it's hard to get your show out if you ever decide, hey, I don't want to be a customer anymore of this service. Um, yeah. We tend to bias toward completely open podcasting. That's why we chose the services that we've done. We're not locked in to any single provider. Um, and so we can take our show and move it, our shows, and move them whenever we need to. We feel like the, the service relationship isn't isn't great. And we don't lose our followers. We don't lose our, you know, subscribers. It's, it's, you know, it's not easy, but it's, well, what's the, what's the phrase? It's not simple, but it's easy, or it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> you get me. Yeah. I'm, I'm not actually sure. When you say that, I'm like, I don't know. Clearly the <laughs> expression is neither easy nor simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's neither easy nor simple. This, in this case, it's simple. It's just not easy. There's a lot of, uh, you know, we use the play bar on our shows is the, the play bar from Transistor. And that means they give you a little code on the Transistor backend interface and you paste that code onto your website and it expands to something you can press play on and it, people can listen to the show on their website. For us, that would mean many, many thousands of lines of copy and paste if we were to move the show from Transistor. We've done that before uh, when we moved to Transistor. I don't know if you remember, Andy. I know it was oh, a traumatic event for you. You may have blocked it out uh, with <laughs> therapy, but it, it's a lot of copy and pasting, and it's kind of a pain, but it's totally doable. Um, and that's a choice that we made because we like their play bar. So there we are. It's it is a, a tricky process, but you know it's it's probably not as hard if you're just doing one podcast. You know, it still is a process. You still have to work through it, but it is nice. And I, I guess the the point here is that it's nice to be in a place where you can change if it makes sense, if it's better for your show, if it helps you reach a broader audience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Being in a situation where it's very difficult to extract. It just, it makes it that much more challenging. Yeah. I, you know, I should add, because I know someone will write me about this because I said this out loud. Um, there are ways to automate the import of episodes into a WordPress website. And our workflow just hasn't changed in a lot of years. And when I test those for like ingesting a new show from an RSS feed, it's great. But we generally like more control over our individual pages. And so that's why our workflow is, is, the way it is, we copy and paste that code. You, it is possible to automatically import with the use of a plugin. Um, 
and um, and we do use that from time to time. So it wouldn't be the end of the world if we had to move, you know, yeah, to a new platform. Plugins, right, right. plugins for the win. Um, <laughs> on the in in terms of drafting my edits, I'll just say a little bit personally about my my own workflow. Sometimes my uh, because I I. I use Obsidian on my end for just notes. All of my text notes are in Obsidian, which you can get at, I, I think it's obsidian.md. Uh, I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, it's just a personal note-taking thing, and it syncs with all your devices, and I just I just love it. I write in Markdown, and so when I find a resource I want to talk about on the show and I'm building my outlines for any of the shows that I do, I generally do start in Obsidian, and I just take them and send them into Coda when it's time to record. Um, and so just because that's where I like to to work um, and it's also local on my computer and Coda, like all web services, uh, sometimes there are outages. It's very, very rare, but uh, sometimes the Internet does Internet things and you try to refresh a page and it won't load and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Thank goodness I have my notes on my local computer. So I tend to start on my local machine in Obsidian and uh, then move stuff when it's time to record. Do you have any personal I, workflow on your end that you use? You know, I don't want to make myself sound like a, <laughs> an old school um, uh, simpleton, but I just, it's all on paper still. <laughs> Whoa. Is that okay to say Whoa. on this show? <laughs> Whoa, I did not expect that. I thought you were going to say like, oh, it's in Word. <laughs> I was going to have it's, to... No, now, right look at your notebook. There's, like, parchment. Is that a feather quill pen? <laughs> I dip it in, in my little ink. It is... Ink no, I actually... Now, that's cool again. There was a time where, where writing on paper <laughs> wasn't cool, I've but you, that you've come back around. Back into cool. <laughs> <laughs> the future is Post-its and the past. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Post yeah. Post-its like these ones. <laughs> You have a dispenser. I've, I have post-its everywhere. I'm always posting. Uh, like even just today, I've been already posting. Wow. But, you know. Outstanding. You this do what insight. works. You, you totally do. And this, I will say, yeah. if you spend a lot of time podcasting with somebody else, as I have with Andy, you only see generally one part, one dimension. You're looking at their head <laughs> and shoulders. You don't see what they're looking at, which is, it, is, it turns out, a sea of post-it notes. <laughs> That's right. You know, it, 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 Pete already has made plenty fun of the way that I utilize my monitor space okay. <laughs> on my computer, because yeah. clearly that is also wrong. But. It's not wrong. It's just uh, anomalous. <laughs> you have a, a massive monitor and are constantly full screen, and I don't know what to do about that. I don't know what to do. I'm a mess of windows when I record. A I'm, mess. I'm working on it. I'm working on having, Important. like, it's just, yeah, it's just, you know. <laughs> Baby steps, <laughs> baby steps into the podcast, baby steps of the podcast. I will say on the back end of the show, I here's another thing that people might have problems with. So once we're done with a show, we have files, right? We're a Logic Pro based uh, studio. And so we edit all of our shows in Logic. And at the end of every show, we um, those Logic files all live in Dropbox between us so that either one of us can jump in and edit when needed. Um, and when we're finished with each episode and it goes live, I take that episode and I archive it. Our cold storage is a Synology, a big Synology drive that sits in my closet and is backed up to um, uh, to the cloud. It's backed up to a, a great big Backblaze for business storage option that so that we have every file that has ever crossed our computers for editing. And um, I think there are... I, I think there are mixed opinions on our archive strategy, which is right now to archive everything. Do we need to archive everything? Do you as a new podcaster need to archive everything? I think there was a day when I thought every year I would be going back to these source files and making clips shows of our past episodes. And I have so, so rarely done that. Uh, that I don't know why we keep everything, but it's just what we do. We, we have our entire archive. Do you think about that ever? You come from film production, like you that also archive everything. Yeah, I mean it's it's handy to have all of this um, information for when it might be needed again. You know, and, and you know, in 
film production, any production, I mean, you, you, whether you're saving on all old film reels or you're saving a whole bunch of hard drives, I mean, just kind of the storage was the thing that you would kind of always do in case you needed it. And right. I think, I, I don't know, I've been involved in so many things over the years where it's come into a situation where suddenly you're like, oh, we really need to look at that again. And you're pulling up old drives with old information or whatever the case may be. So I don't know. For me, keeping all of that stuff makes sense. I mean, the cost of storage these days isn't, uh, it's, it just kind of gets cheaper and cheaper to yeah. store the things that you need. So it That's just true. makes sense to me to to be saving things for when you need it, you know, especially if it's your business or it's, it's the thing that you're creating and putting yeah. out into the world. Why not make sure that you have access to it in case you, something happens? I mean, you never know. Somebody may one day hack into your show and it may not be, you know, pumping out what your show was and you need to repost it. I mean, for sure. that's probably a strange example, but you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Well, I'll tell you an example where that has come up, not the hacking part, but the the benefit of having the the actual source files. Um, you know, we sometimes rebroadcast old episodes. And when we have season breaks, we'll, you know, take every other week and we'll throw old episodes in and I'll record sometimes a little new intro of, of this podcast yeah. or that. Right. And one of the things that's really nice is when we go to shows that are years old, I can remaster them pretty quickly using our current set of plugins that actually make sweeten the sound. So when I rebroadcast old episodes, they often sound uh, appreciably better than they than they did when we originally released them five seven years ago. Just because the technology has changed, we're able to to do more. We've learned more about our own edits and and how we master shows. So. Um, I think that's just one example of having those source files and not just relying on the MP3 that you end up, you know, publishing for those things. Yeah, it's it's because you know, especially depend. I mean, you never know. Depending on where your show is playing, it may be getting ads baked in, and right. if you have to go pull an episode that um, because you don't have the archive what you're pulling will have those baked in ads. And, and that's now, a pain. It's a pain to yeah, cut the yeah. ads. Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah, but a lot of really interesting content for sure. That's a you know window into a part of the podcast management side of things that I think will likely be helpful to people. I hope so. Thanks everybody yeah, for listening to the podcast podcast, podcast about yes. podcasting for True Story FM. This is, this is a fun show for us to do and we appreciate you listening. Thanks everybody. Mm-hmm.